Welcome to the Vortex Nation podcast, brought to you by lovers of hunting, shooting, public lands, the Second Amendment, and good food. All right, what's up, everybody? Uh, By the time this podcast reaches your ears, it will likely be about mid-February. And why that is important to us right now is that's because if you did put in, the Alaska draws are going to be coming out likely about that time. If you drew a Prince of Wales Island bear tag uh, during, or if you're lucky to, in the upcoming draw, you're going to have a long time to wait because that's an interesting draw cycle. So I've been personally waiting to go on that hunt for about a year and a half now, and I'm chomping at the bit which not exactly bear hunting itself is not the topic of this conversation. Oh, okay. I was wondering where you were going with that. I'm trying to get there, Jim. I'm trying to do one of those (laughs) fancy intros No, this is really good. Keep going. You always weave it in so well. Why that pertains to us right now and the guests that are gracing our presence is because we are sitting down with Casey and John from 60th Parallel, and we're going to talk about hunting for the first time in Alaska. So this is prob- this podcast is probably geared towards a person who has hunted. If you've he- listened to a few of our previous podcasts, like the, the Classifieds Hunter, that was geared more towards maybe your first hunt. This is probably going to be geared towards somebody that has hunted in the past, but is looking to hunt Alaska for the first time, or plans to hunt Alaska for the first time, or potentially drew a tag and... Uh, you know, has a little bit of uh, planning ahead of them. So, Jim, I don't know. What do you think? No, I think that's a good way to put it. I mean, yeah, we've talked we talked about a number of different things. The Classified Center, I think, was the perfect episode for somebody who understands where they live locally. They see some hunting opportunity locally, and, um, you know, they're just trying to get outdoors. Now, once you start talking about Alaska, you know, unless you live in Alaska, and maybe you've just grown up around this, but, uh, you know, if you're talking about Alaska, I mean, that's that's pretty much... From, from everything we've gathered. Of course, we're speaking, we have two people from Alaska here right now, so we shouldn't put too many words in their mouth. But it's it's definitely an, an, an adventure. So A little, should, b- little bit of a different ball game. Let's, in, let's do some introductions. This is John and one half of 60th Parallel, and i uh, got Casey sitting here next to me. And we both are uh, longtime Alaskans. Uh, I grew up in Alaska and have kind of hunted there all my life. And Casey's been there almost a decade now, right? Eight yeah, or nine yeah. years? Yep. Something like that. Getting closer, and, yep. And we've been hunting together pretty much that whole time. Uh, try to do some content creation while we're out there a lot of the times. Uh, photography and videography and that sort of thing. And as a result of that, we get a lot of people who see our stuff and, and ask us about Alaska. Kind of like you guys are saying. And they're, they're, it seems like they usually fall into one of two camps. Either they feel like Alaska is really intimidating. They feel like it's not very approachable. It, it, they see big dollar signs um, and feel like the weather is is really intimidating the terrain is really intimidating they just don't either don't know where to start or feel like they can't afford it or on the other side of things maybe they've done a little more research and they're a little overconfident (laughs) and and like they're like i'm i can't wait to get to alaska and this is what i want to hunt and i've looked into this and this is where i want to go and we love that we love people coming to us and and asking that because we love trying to share what we get to enjoy we think alaska is amazing and it's fun to get to spread that around. And so our goal is, is usually to, for those guys that are intimidated to say, Hey, this is approachable. This is real. This is something that, yeah, you got to do some research. Yeah. You're going to have to save up a little money, but anyone can do this. It's definitely uh, realistic. And for the guys who are maybe a a little, a little too gung ho and unrealistic in their expectations, trying to temper that a little bit and say, Hey, whoa, okay. Yeah, you absolutely should do this, but these are some things you need to take into account. Like, this is for real. There are real stakes when you're hunting in Alaska. You can get hurt, or you can waste a lot of money <laughs> and get in, with, you know, with in a bad area or with with bad charters or su- support that kind of thing. So, and you even said it when we were talking just prior to this. You can die. That's on the table. <laughs> 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 stakes are higher. They really yeah, are. They they are indeed. You can die doing just about anything. You can die in the middle of the street, in the middle of, you know, bus hits you or whatever. But I actually did almost Alaska. get hit by a bus the other day. Well, <laughs> there you have That's it. That's a true story. Well, Casey, let's talk a little bit about you or introduce yourself. And so you are, I guess, not born and raised Alaska, but you did end up there. So I want to hear about that story a little bit and maybe how you guys ran into each other and connected up. Yeah. 
So I guess, you know, I was, I was born and raised in the Midwest, uh, Nebraska boy, farm boy, um, until I was about 20 years old, moved to Wyoming, went to school at University of Wyoming. And, uh, shortly thereafter, when I, uh, started my job, my first big boy job, so to speak in the, in the oil field, uh, I started guiding and, um, got into elk, uh, mule deer, Western hunting and so on and so forth. And, Ended up a few years later taking a job in Alaska, and I uh, work for the state now as a erosion control specialist for my normal day job. And um, I remember uh, it was kind of surreal, you know, always wanted to hunt Alaska, um, like I think a lot of hunters can relate, you know, like sheep and moose and everything else um, when I first moved to Alaska. And I was one of those kind of overconfident guys when I first moved up there, and uh Got settled in. Um, Which is pretty pretty crazy because you had a lot of hunting experience. Yeah. You know, I guided for about five, six years in, in Wyoming and did a lot of pack out elk hunts, um, mule deer, antelope, so on and so forth. And kind of was like, well, I can, you know, I was young in, in my 20s, kind of like, I can do anything mentality, you know, and uh, Looking back on it, I was I was kind of arrogant and uh, dumb at the same time. And uh, <laughs> it <laughs> sounds go, like the twenties, right? Right, right which comes general. with that territory once in a while. And I remember preparing. Uh, I got to Alaska, and the, and the first thing that I wanted to go hunt was a moose. And I remember one of the clients that I'd actually guided in Wyoming uh, was a master guide in Alaska, and he kind of took me under his wing that first fall and winter that I couldn't hunt. You know, I wasn't a resident yet, and he basically pulled me aside and he said, Hey, he goes, you know, you need to not do moose your first go around, <laughs> you know, like, like, uh, and I was like, why, you know? And he's like, well, what are your plans? How are you plan on doing it? And so I kind of started laying it out. Well, you know, I'm gonna do a float hunt and yada, yada, yada. And he goes, well, how long is that float hunt going to be? And I said, well, I said, I'm probably going to go like 12 to 14 days, you know, two weeks is kind of the norm. And, uh, he said, so if you saw a bull on day one or day two of that hunt, and you're going to float, you know, 50 to, you know, 75 miles or so, and then get picked up by your, by your plane, would you shoot a big trophy bull like the first or second day? And I was like, uh, duh, absolutely. And he was like, wrong. Um, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, what, why? And he's like, well, you know, like if you've got a solid week and a half of floating ahead of you, you know, depending on where you're at and you're in, you know, you're only in class one water, which is, you know, real slow and you're going to, you're going to have issues, um, you know, with the raft, maybe getting the high center, dragging it down the stream. It's going to be real slow going. And uh, that meat could start to turn on you to temp- depending on the temperature. You're in thick bear country. It's definitely a hunt you don't want to do by yourself. I was looking at going in solo oh my uh, for, for my first hunt, and uh, I couldn't find anybody to go with me, uh, oddly enough, that would take enough time, you know, and so on and so forth. And he kind of turned me on to um, stepping into a caribou uh, slash sheep hunt for my first hunt. And it's still a flying hunt. And yeah, I ended up uh, preparing and preparing, and we went through. I took all my gear from that I had from guiding in, in the lower 48, and he's like, well, bring it over. And he's like, I'll, you know, we'll lay it out here on the garage floor, and we'll look at it and see what you kind of, what you have. And I'll, he's like, I'll never tell anybody directly, like, this absolutely won't work most of the time. He's like, well, I'll just give you suggestions. So I did. I took all my gear over there, and I laid everything out. And again, I was very cocky and mentality like that I had everything because I had been guiding, right? You know, if I can pack an elk out, my mentality was I can pack a moose or just a little bit bigger. And uh, they're a lot bigger. (laughs) FYI. Um, I was just thinking in my head, uh, wow, that's a little bit to some people is a lot. (laughs) Yeah, right. Yeah, a little bit by like, you know, 700 pounds. And so anyway, we laid all this stuff out. And um, he said, well, if you don't mind, I'll just take the stuff over and put, you know, the stuff that I think it's not going to work on one side and we'll leave whatever I think is going to work in the center. After that, about, you know, 15 minutes of him pulling gear, I had about three items left in the center. And all the other stuff was over in a pile on the other side. And I was kind of like, oh, man, I got a lot of gear that I need to get. And I need to really rethink what I got going on here. And I've so, only got three items, and one of them is a pack of gum. Right, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Very important. So, uh, so yeah, I had the abrupt curve, I guess you'd say, spending curve of getting a little bit better gear, getting everything up to speed, and... Uh, I got what I could the first year. You know, I still had, you know, clothing and stuff that first year. I, I wasn't able to afford a lot, but I got what I could and uh, went out on a caribou slash sheep hunt. I was actually fortunate enough my first year to draw a tag for the Nelchina herd caribou and called my cousin up because I couldn't find anybody to go with me and 
uh, he flew up from Kansas and we went out on this hunt. And I remember they flew me in first on the Super Cub and went back to go get my, my cousin. And uh, even in all my confidence now, you know, I had had it, had it figured out. I had my food figured out. I had everything like dialed in pretty good as far as you can't get any better than this. Like I got it down to an Excel spreadsheet down to the ounce, right? And the plane flew away and the clouds kind of socked in the lower part of the valley. And I kind of looked around and I was like this gut sinking feeling. I was like, oh boy, like what did I get myself into? <laughs> um, I'm all by myself. Yeah, and, you are alone. Yeah, and it took, uh, it took a couple hours for them to um, bring my cousin in because they, they went to fly him in and the plane was flying above and he couldn't land because it had socked back in. So they took him back and waited and I waited and I thought, I'm going to be out here all by myself. Like this was a totally new experience. You know, I had camped many times um, in the Bighorn Mountains in Wyoming and uh, parts of the Wind Rivers and, and so on and so forth. And but this was different. I could I couldn't I couldn't just walk out to the truck, and uh, it it really put a gut sinking feeling and a, and a reality check. But thankfully, anyway, they brought him in, and we were able to hunt, and we had a successful hunt. And I just learned a lot, learned a lot about my diet, what I could go through, what I couldn't go through, and uh, we didn't go that far from camp. That was the other thing. Like I was like, I'm gonna go wherever I want, and I learned real quick that the terrain was so rough that I literally there was places I could not go. Where, like, when I guided in Wyoming, I mean, there was obviously some very rough country, not putting it down whatsoever, but there were very few places I couldn't go, that I couldn't crawl on my hands and knees and, you know, hoist my pack through. There was many places <laughs> that I could physically not go, where animals could go, and I couldn't get them, which was super <laughs> frustrating because I could see them, you know? And so, so, yeah, that was kind of the, that was kind of the entry of that, and so. Wow. I mean, that's super interesting. I mean, and really, uh, I mean, I almost want to elaborate more on this hunt because, you know, the people that we're talking to in this podcast are you on this hunt and the things that, that you learned along the way and things that maybe you don't necessarily think about on the front end and yeah. not, not through anybody's fault or anything. It's just stuff that you just don't realize until you get out there. Like, you know, you're talking a little bit about diet. And I'd actually, I'd be curious to know yeah. what you're talking but about. But even, even so, though, like... You, the thing that I think you got to put in pers- into perspective is like he mentioned a couple times, like you were a guide and the a- average person listening to this podcast right now won't be even going into this being, having been a guide. No. You know I mean? So that's even starting from that point and the ending in that kind of culture shock, as soon as you got out there is, is something in and of itself. I mean, to say the least, but you know, I think one of the big things that you got to talk about when you're talking about somebody thinking of taking on Alaska is when you look at Alaska, I mean, there's there's game that it's just crazy to think about even going after like you got these sheep you got these caribou like moose and stuff and there's also deer out there do you go on i mean is it what animal do you go after when you're thinking about this you know is it do people when they look at alaska do they think well i can go deer hunting in the lower 48 too why would i want to hunt a deer in alaska you know or i could you know i gotta go after something crazy in alaska is that always the case do you always need to go after some crazy exotic sounding creature or we wish more people would approach us from that perspective usually it's the other side of the coin and we want to flip it to where they're thinking that way usually they're coming to us with an animal in mind and it's usually bell sheep you know grizzly or brown bear or or moose those are kind of the three people are super super pumped about understandably those are some of our favorite things to hunt for sure i mean they're incredible animals they're incredible animals and they're an incredible country at those kind of hunts generate incredible experiences. But like you said, there's all kinds of critters in Alaska, and Alaska is an experience in and of itself, mm-hmm. right? you know, yep. separate from yep. the animal that you're pursuing. Uh, an amazing experience, but also one that requires some preparation, uh, some knowledge. And so we love it when people have the perspective that you just put forward of, what should I hunt in Alaska? And mm-hmm. our answer is usually... Hey, if you're interested in Alaska, you like the idea of adventure, you want to wrap your head around this, let's start with one of these three animals, caribou, sick of black-tailed deer, or uh, black bear. And there's a number of reasons why we point people towards those those animals. Part of it is, first and foremost, you don't need a guide. Um, we have a lot of friends who are guides. We've worked as guides a little bit in Alaska, and there's a lot of really good guides out there, and that's a really good way to go. We don't want to dissuade people from using guides if that's on the table for them. But um, for some people, they either want the satisfaction of doing themselves or they have budgetary constraints Mm -hmm. that um, push them towards doing it DIY. And if that's the case, those three species 
it's approachable and it's doable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So other ones you actually you're saying that you actually have to go with a guide. Oh, good some, point. So there some. there are doll sheep, mountain goat, and brown slash grizzly bear. You're required by law to use a guide as an out of stater. As an out of stater, mm-hmm. exactly. Okay. Residents um, can hunt them on their own, but as a non-resident, they require to use a, uh, the services of a of a licensed guide. And the, being a licensed guide in Alaska is actually a pretty in-depth process. Uh, they, they go through quite a lot of vetting to get to that point. And the reason being, those three species in particular are just more dangerous. They are more valuable as a, an animal to the, to the ecosystem and to the state monetarily, but they are also just frankly more dangerous. They take a little more knowledge to do it successfully and safe, safely and not they don't want hunters going out there and getting hurt and being a burden <laughs> on the emergency services, et cetera, yeah, right? That's a fair point. That yeah. kind of thing. So with mountain goat and sheep, a big part of it, is, with mountain goat, they're just, it's in, they're in nasty terrain and you run the risk of getting hurt from the environment, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yep. from, from falling off a cliff or getting stuck out there with the wrong gear in the wrong area and getting hammered with weather, getting, you know, having the temperatures drop real quickly, that kind of thing. With sheep... It's partly that, you know, you're in that same kind of rough terrain and you run the risk of being hurt by the terrain and by the weather. It's also, they're also kind of difficult to judge. And so as a novice going in, they're a precious resource and we yep. don't want people shooting sublegal rams and it can be difficult to judge them without, without experience. And so it helps to have that guide. And then you judge them based on the, uh, on their horns. You do, you judge them based on their horns and it varies from area to area, but generally speaking, you're looking for mature rams that are full curl. In most areas, they require it to be full curl, which can be hard to tell but you, based on your angle of line of sight. And that yeah, kind of unless thing. they're like a perfect side silhouette yeah. or something. And even right. then, if you're you know unfamiliar with the, with the animal, it can be tough to, to make that call. And there's a couple other ways they can be legal if they're broomed off on both sides. Right, right. Meaning they've broken off their horns. They probably grew past full curl and then have, have broken them off past a certain point that qualifies as broomed. And then finally, if they're eight years old or older, which you count their rings of the horns, much like a tree has age rings, so do sheep. And that takes a lot of nuance. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of skill and practice to read. I was going to ask you guys, I mean, you've hunted sheep a lot. I have not at all. Uh, I have hunted Alaska before. But, I mean, even with all the experience that you have, like, I mean, would you be confident going off – growth rings well you know i kind of chalk it up as uh and i'll i'll put it in 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 the words of a guy that i know it's it's a master guide guided for 40 plus years and i was telling him about a sheep hunt that i was on and i passed on a ram that i wasn't 100 percent sure he wasn't full curl and i was trying to count annuli and i could not distinctively get eight and a half years out of him right so I let him walk, and he stopped me midstream in the story, and he said, if you're counting rings, you're playing with fire. He's like, don't ever shoot a ram off counting rings. Go fully off of if they're broken or broomed and or if they're eight, or excuse me, if they're full curl. And uh, it, I kind of looked at him funny. I was like, this is a guy that had umpteen sheep underneath his belt and right. uh, guiding for 40-plus years and a Super Cub pilot and could judge, like literally flew with the fishing game and did head counts, and I mean, he could – he could look at a ram and he could tell you his length within a half of an inch. Wow. Just about every time. And so mm. I was like, man, this is a guy that's got unbelievable experience. And he's sitting here telling me, don't do it. Like, don't do it. And there's, there's some guys that probably will listen to this podcast and tell, you know, say, well, I don't know. Yeah, there's plenty can, of experienced sheep hunters out right. there who will shoot a ram based off, based off annuli. Right. No doubt about it. But it's tough. Even though we've been on a lot of sheep hunts, I still, I'll count rings as a third choice you know sure. just just as a third confirmation but i like to see definite full curl and i like to see broken or broomed hmm. um, gotcha. and it's like anything with there's a lot of you know features that you're looking at to determine a mature animal right like yeah like like a lot of animals you're looking for that roman nose you know um the the mass mm-hmm. on the body um things like that can mm-hmm. help yep. can help you know, if you're like oh i don't know you know Right there at full yep. curl. I think I count eight and a half rings, up, but like, no, this uh, this animal has a really slender face. Uh, you know, uh, his body size is kind of not too different from the other like six or seven year old rams floating around there. He's like, Ugh. Right. yep, hmm. maybe not. Well, and kind of going back on what we were talking about as far as getting, as far as being able non resident resident being able to hunt uh, those sp- specific animals as far as sheep and brown bear and mountain goat. 
a non-resident, if they have next of kin, uh, second degree kindred, they call it. So if you have a brother mm-hmm. or somebody that lives in Alaska, you can, that's second degree kindred, that you can hunt with them as a non-resident, but they have to be within, I think, like a hundred yards of you when you take the animal. Right. And yeah. don't and, quote, don't quote us on the, any of this numbers. They've changed the yeah the they're constantly regs a little bit on this lately. So check current regs for yeah. yep. how how that stuff works. Always please. a good call. <laughs> so the, the, the reason I bring that up though is because we're we're talking about first timers coming to Alaska, right? Right. And and I have heard numerous stories of people that move to Alaska and they the first thing they want to go after. You know, sheep hunting is kind of all the rage when you move to Alaska, right? Right. Like that's that's um, it's a very select, unique group of people. But they get up there and they get in that crowd and they and they want to hunt sheep. And the first thing they'll do is, you know, brother, sister, father, whatever, uncle will come up and they'll plan a sheep hunt. That's the first thing they want to go after. And again, my thought on that and the recommendation would be go back to as if you were a non-resident and go into the black bear, the the sick of black tail deer, um, and and the caribou. And start there to, to cut your teeth, so to speak, because, again, for all the reasons. They're hard to judge. They're in nasty terrain. And now, all of a sudden, it's no different than if two non-residents just moved up and mm-hmm. went, went out, right? Mm-hmm. So um, just a little side note to that. <laughs> so, so here's a question, too. And, and by, by no means does this question – am I asking this question but in a way that places value on one animal versus another animal? So so don't, don't take it this way, but I'm – if you go after, let's say, a sick of black-tailed deer or a caribou or a black bear, are you selling yourself short of the full-on Alaska experience? Let's say you know that you're only going to have like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go up to Alaska and you go after one of these. Or, or maybe it's just not going to be a very often thing. And the reason I ask, are you selling yourself short? Again, it's not because are these animals any less awesome than the other animals. It's not that at all. But is it... Let's say somebody wants to really get that extreme. If you follow, we should have mentioned this too, 60th Parallel on Instagram, you'll see these photos. And these photos are like, these photos should be murals in the Louvre or whatever that place is. Well, they've, <laughs> they've often been murals in our catalogs and, and our, our trade booths show booths. And, yeah, and exactly. <laughs> and uh, But when you look at these places that you guys go to, I mean, they just look so extreme. And it's these just intense landscapes that look so cool. Like, can you go to these places and be hunting these black-tailed deer or caribou yes. or things like that? That's, is that, yep. you know, is it's... That's a really good question. It yeah. is. And that's that's why we point people towards that. Because you can get that same experience whether you're looking to float a river or you're looking to uh, get in... Our, our forte is the mountains. We like to get into the high country. And you can really hunt just about any of the big game species just about uh, are found in Alaska in the mountains and get that experience. And... For us, we feel like that's the first and foremost thing is mm-hmm. that experience, mm-hmm. right? The the feeling of being self sufficient, you know, that that pride and saying, "Hey, like I all uh, I'm living out here just on my my gear and my wits, and my good judgment, and just awe inspiring beauty that you're soaking up." The the feeling of being removed from society and and your regular life and all the stresses that go with that the pursuit of an animal and the, the blood, sweat, strain that you're putting your body through in covering that country, those experiences can all you, can all be the same whether you're chasing uh, caribou. We, a lot of the, our favorite places to hunt caribou, they are in sheep country. It's, they're right there with the sheep. They're on the top of these mountains, and they're not small mountains. And the same is true of yep. sick of black-tailed deer, especially if you're hunting them earlier in the season. Mm-hmm. Same is true of black bears um, early in the spring or late in the fall. You know, early season, they tend to be down low within the fish, but you get later in the season, they're up on the high slopes. A lot of times they're eating mm. berries and stuff like that. So you're getting your mountain hunting. You absolutely can get that same experience. And everybody has their favorite trophies or, you know, favorite species that uh, speaks to them, I think. But, um, man, you put a, a caribou head on the wall, like people will be impressed with that. You will yeah. be impressed with that. They, they're right. gorgeous and I'm, they're they're huge. Yeah, I mean, I think... You know, in my experience hunting Alaska, you're, I guess this goes for a lot of hunts, but for some reason, Alaska is truly special in this capacity to me. You are hunting the place as much as you are the animals that you're after. And I've been fortunate enough to spend time in southeast Alaska and, you know, north central Alaska and on Kodiak. And in each one of those places, 
They're just the most awe-inspiring, breathtaking, just all-encompassing, comprehensive, fulfilling Mm -hmm. experiences. You know, none of those hunts, you know, you're talking about when you're talking about Sitka blacktails and black bears and and caribou, those are not gimmies. Like you said, you know, in a lot of ways, oftentimes you're hunting those places that you're in very similar terrain as you know, the quote, I guess, you know, premier species, however, however you want to, however right. you want to call that, I guess. But yeah, I mean, I guess yeah. you can't, I mean, it's, it's the size of the hunt and you can definitely get a big hunt out of any of those. That's for sure. That's right. Darn sure. And we don't want to deter people from, from going after any particular critter in Alaska. We encourage people to, to do that. Like they're, mm. they're all, you know, within reach. We just like to have people think it through and know what they're getting into and we've we've found through our own personal experience and through you know helping other people hunt in Alaska that those particular three species uh, lend themselves towards wrapping your head around Alaska because those three species something they have in common is that judging them is uh, at least from a legality standpoint trophy quality judging can be difficult in any species um, including those three but from a legal standpoint it's pretty easy it's hard to mess up um, with caribou and black bear and sick of black-tailed deer because with all those species, like so with deer you can shoot, depending on the time of year, it's either any buck or any deer. Uh, With caribou, your tag is usually going to be for any bull. And with uh, black bear, it's any bear that doesn't have cubs, right? Right. So, and that isn't a cub. And so that's pretty hard to mess up versus uh, moose where they have very strict rules on, hey, it has to be 50 inches wide or wider. It uh, it has to have three brow tines or more on one side. It has to have a spike or a fork on one side or the other. And for a novice to say, no, that's 48 inches. I can't pull the trigger on that. That is not actually a true brow tine. It's not on the actual palm, uh, brow palm of the antler. Um, That's tough to judge if you're coming in cold and, and haven't seen a lot of moose. Oh, um, big time. You know, right. I'll, I'll speak as a first-time Alaska moose hunter this yes, fall. that's yep. right. And my buddy shot a really nice bull. We were actually in a pretty unique area. It was an any bull unit. Um, what made it really nice, Mark? Uh, he <laughs> shot the biggest bull of the trip, Jim. I'll okay. Put, oh, okay. I see. And uh, we, had, <laughs> we, had, we, had a, we had a podcast about trophy hunting or... Maybe that. Anyway, just, we touched on that topic. Big animals, and uh, and uh, <laughs> but anyway, I mean that that really went through my head, and one of the reasons that was like when I saw his bull, I'm like, oh, dude, freaking giant, dude, 50 inch bull, yep. and it was like a low 40s bull, and I'm like, to your exact point, I was like, if you told me that I had to say this is a 48 or a 50 or 55 inch bull, like I'd be like. Yeah. No way. Like, I'm only pulling the trigger unless I see, like, a true giant bull where there's, like, absolutely no mistaking. Right. But, Which is, like, if you've never seen a moose before, they're all huge. They're all huge. <laughs> exactly. And, right. But, I mean, like, even a 40-inch bull, like like I said, at first glance, I'd be like, oh, dude, you killed, like, 50-inch bull. Sweet. And it was, right. like, way yeah. off. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's still a beautiful giant animal, and we were way fortunate. But if you are in an area that had a 50-inch minimum, you'd be in a pickle exactly mm-hmm. exactly we don't want people to have pickles no pickles well how about <laughs> here's another pickle that people get into actually i like pickles so we can keep those but um <laughs> here's another pickle that people get into is now now maybe they've decided what they're going after getting there right so yeah. you look at the you look at the state of alaska they don't exactly have a bustling interstate system that connects to every single point in the state and every single place that you might want to go hunt I mean, a lot of the hunts that you guys go into, you mentioned a couple times, you fly in. Right. How do you how do you navigate figuring out the logistics of coming over from the mainland, going to Alaska? First off, you got to get a flight into Alaska. I can only imagine you're probably usually flying into like Anchorage or some big usually bigger. one of the two big hubs, Anchorage yeah. or Fairbanks, yep. most often. Okay, and yeah. then you got to figure out a way to get to wherever you're going, which is. I can only imagine, again, some kind of mixture of driving to then a small airport to then going in a Piper Cub to, I mean, how does all that work out? How do you find out where these, like, these little bush pilots are? And Right. Well, that's the great, I'll, I'm going to let Casey handle most of, most of this because this is what he spends most of his time off season doing is logistics. But this is the key next question. Once you've decided on species, that's how you determine where you're hunting in Alaska virtually is, is access. 
Mm -hmm. Like you said, we have like two highways in the in the state, and they don't touch anywhere near most of Alaska. So it's very different approach from um, hunting in a lot of other places because you you usually there are road system hunts. There's definitely and there's some good ones, mm -hmm. but like well, any, some of those species that you're talking about before, some of the reasons to choose those are because those travel logistics are a little bit more within reach or a little bit simplified. Absolutely, right. yeah, yep. and. So roads, road system can be, hunts can be a great way to access animals on a, on a lower budget. And there's some good ways to do that, but it usually tends to take a lot more research and a lot more time because if, if it's off the road system, there's going to be more pressure. There's going to be, you know, less, less animal density, less trophy quality. You're going to have to work harder for it. And you're going to have to do your research to figure out those little pockets where, you know, like anywhere that has pressure. Yep. You know, you, you want to try to find those pockets where the hunting is still good, even though other people have access to it as well. And you know, you'd be willing to hike it through an area that nobody else wants to hike through, you know, or farther than everybody else wants to hike through, <laughs> you know, or something like that. But realistically, most of the state is accessible, preferably by plane or by boat. Yep. Those are kind of the two ways that you're going to be hunting most of the state or a combination of both. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of hiking, generally speaking. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> um, but that being said, you know, Casey's our logistics pro. Yeah, so I guess I'll just back up a quick little story to that. So, uh, again, when I first got up there and I uh, was talking to several guides and trying to figure out if I was going to go off the road system or if I was going to go fly in or, you know, kind of depended on my budget as well. You know, obviously going off the road system is going to be cheaper mm -hmm. than, you're, than paying a charter plane to fly you in. The one thing that just threw me off, I mean, Alaska is a big state, and I, I know people hear that a lot, but, you know, we're, we're talking from basically North Dakota to Florida, right, in size. And, uh, Jiminy Christmas, I never realized. And, uh, I've, never, I've never had it. Now, there's some context. Yeah, yeah it's, wow. you know, from, from southeast to Barrow, right? Yeah. Like, like Alaska's a big state. So dissecting it is, is really tough, right? And, and that comes with the species. And, and then you got to ask yourself, are you going for more trophy quality or are you going more, more for... Uh, population density, and you just want to, you know, do more of a of a meat hunt, so on and so forth. But a lot of the people I was talking to were talking about names that, like, it was just a place. I had no reference point on where anything was at. You know, they're like, oh yeah, well, you, you know, you could, you should you should look at like the floating the no attack or something like that. I'm like, okay, yeah, the Noah cool, what? Cool man, or the Quijack River. And half the places you can't pronounce either. Like, they're really, really <laughs> difficult to pronounce to add that to it. So Yeah, people thought going to Wisconsin and pronouncing our towns was tough. Right. Yeah. So so that, that, was, that was a huge learning curve. And I would say, you know, for somebody on the outside looking in, you know, you've got this big map of Alaska, and it's, it's super daunting. And you're like, okay, well, you know, here's my species that I want to go after. And once you narrow down a good area to, to, to go after that species – We'll, we'll pick caribou f as, as an example for mm -hmm. talking point. That's going to go off of, like, I would start to look at, like, herd, uh, which herd. and So to be clear, we have multiple herds, quote, unquote, of caribou yes. throughout the state that have their kind of migration patterns established and vary in numbers, you know, from correct, a, yep. you know, a few thousand to tens of thousands. How do you find out about these herds and migration patterns and stuff? Fishing game is a great source. Alaska, Alaska fishing. They've game. got that and, pretty well. Yeah, and there's like, I forget the exact number. Somewhere between twenty and thirty herds in the state. Huh, to give okay. you an idea, right? And some of them range from a few thousand to, like the. Uh, Northwest Arctic herd was used to be like around 400,000 and now it's down to like 220,000, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it really depends on, uh, again, like what we were talking about a bit ago, like what's your experience, right? Like your experience is going to be totally different going to the North Slope and, and hunting that herd versus hunting uh, a mountain range, right? And hunting small pockets of caribou that are high up in the rocks mm -hmm. that for all intents and purposes act like Mountain caribou, not barren ground. That's a whole other topic. So, uh, <laughs> so learning the critter that you want to go after is first and foremost. And then the second point I would bring would be if you do choose to fly in, vetting and finding a very good charter pilot. These pilots make their living off of putting you in an area that, A, they know very well. That's probably, I mean, they're not going to put you there and stay in business if they keep putting people there and they're not getting critters, going to, right? So they're going to oh, put yeah. you in an area that they know where there's a potential 
a high opportunity to get it get a good critter. And they're also going to most charter pilots will be a very good judge of not all, but most will be a very good judge of like your experience level. And they'll they'll ask you um, if you haven't flown with them before. You know, oh, well, you know, first to first time to Alaska, or have you hunted Alaska before? Mm-hmm. So you know. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to put you here then because there's, you know, less likelihood of you running into grizzly bear issues, or there's less hmm. likelihood of you falling off a cliff or whatever else. So that's 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 a really big point when trying to logistically kind of center yourself in the in a, in a hunt in Alaska. So it can't be emphasized enough. Like that decision, choosing the right charter pilot or uh, or um, captain in some cases. Right. Uh, right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, with boats, for the reasons that Casey just outlined, they are almost as good as a guide. It's kind of like hiring a guide other than they won't actually be accompanying you in the field, but they have a lot of that same knowledge base mm-hmm. uh, if, you're mm-hmm. finding, if you're finding the right one. Do you find them on, like, Alaskan Craigslist or something, or what? <laughs> <laughs> that is a tougher question, and that's when we say, you know, hey, you want to try to find people who are not the guy, you know, not in that industry, but that are from Alaska or have been to Alaska a bunch and can refer you to people. Yeah. Hmm. Um, getting that uh, first or second hand knowledge i think is key with finding a reputable you would um, go pilot. to the uh, uh <clears throat> strictly plain tonic section <laughs> <laughs> right couldn't help it <laughs> <laughs> uh, i mean people are always welcome to to shoot us an email or a you know dm on instagram and, oh, cool. and we're always happy to answer questions that people have but yeah finding trying to vet your your charter service is a big deal and then they're gonna be able to put they have their spots established they know where they can land their plane you know they have their their honey holes and their cleaning strips already already laid out and they know how many people have been to those that season already yep. Yep. you know whether it's a lot of times they have their own spots where it's kind of gentleman's agreement the other charter services know that oh so and so lands there or maybe it's a secret and they don't tell people you know right um, sometimes it's a freaking glacier it, yeah that's right <laughs> yeah <laughs> land planes on glacier those, those charter pilots they got to have some serious guts, I'll say. That's the other reason you want to hire a good one, because <laughs> right. your, your life is literally in your hands, right? Yep. Uh, yep. Or in their hands. And the weather can be bad. You're in a tiny little plane, usually like a Super Cub, where it's you and the pilot, and that's all that fits in your backpack. Or, you know, a little 180, or sometimes maybe as big as a, a beaver. <laughs> you know, which, that's about as big as they get. Which, side note here, just f- for those of you that are listening that, have never flown in a super cub. They are tiny. They are super <laughs> tiny planes. I'm six foot and 180 pounds and I'm crammed in them. And I always kind of chuckle when John gets in them because he's much bigger than me. And, and, uh, you know, it's like shoving some, you know, a whole bunch of sardines in one can. It's, uh, it's pretty crazy. And you're only allowed on most cases, like 50 pounds of gear, right? Cause Which I mean, is, like you said, it's small. I mean, it's a two seater. It is, and the pilot sits right in front of you. By two, um, you mean the pilot and you. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. when people talk about ultralight hunting, it's all—it's not only to get you further in the mountain when you're hiking, but it's also literally just to allow you on the plane. That's it. Right. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, if I remember. It, if it comes to that, if it comes to flying or something. Right. I remember uh, the first that first one I spoke about earlier, that caribou and sheep hunt that I flew in on, I, I uh, was struggling and struggling and struggling at that point in time to get my gear down to 50 pounds. Mm-hmm. And... Um, or excuse me, 70 pounds with this pilot. He was gracious enough to be like 70 pounds. Okay. Um, well, it which depends which, on what kind of engine they're running in their cub and right. what kind of airstrip they're, probably how, how heavy, what the run right. rate is at, that they're putting you in. How heavy right. you are, maybe? Yes. How heavy absolutely. you are, correct. Yeah. And so he was like 70 pounds, no more, right? And that's not including your rifle because your rifle actually goes on the wing on a scabbard most of the time. And so. Freak me out. Which man. freaks you out the first time. Yeah. <laughs> Don't drop that. <laughs> yeah, I got a you know expensive rifle. My my baby sitting on the wing as I'm watching it out the window. But uh, I got there and I was like you know 78 pounds and uh, I was like I, I gotta have this stuff. Which side note by the way too. I, I now I'm down to like below 50 pounds. Right. Right. <laughs> For all the stuff I need, plus camera gear now. Uh, but anyway, at the time I thought I needed much more to live. And uh, he kind of chuckled when I when he pulled my pack out and tried to throw it in the back of the plane. Oh, what do you got in here? Huh? Well, I said, you know, this, and that, and the other. And he says, well, it seems like it's over 70. And I said, yeah. I said, it's about 78. He said, okay. He said, well, reach in there. And he goes, we're going to pull some stuff out. And I was like, no. And he's like, don't <laughs> worry. We're just going to set it on your lap. Because we couldn't have all that weight behind me tail dragging because you go to take off. Oh, okay. The, the, gotcha. plane, the plane wants to oh, tail drag okay. going through the air and he doesn't, doesn't get the proper lift. So he was, he was gracious enough. You know, he was a good pilot. had powerful enough motor and we were going on a bigger strip but uh so i was even more crammed 
because now I got this big dry bag <laughs> sitting on my lap and I can't move and I'm trying to take photos and <laughs> I'm nervous because my gun's out on the wing of the plane. You know, it was just like complete pandemonium in my head, but I played calm, cool, and collected in the plane. But so, <laughs> side note for that, for if you're going to go in a Super Cub, be ready. If you're, if you're a big guy, you're going to have some problems getting in one, but they'll, they'll squeeze. I see some guys that get in there that are much bigger than me and I'm just like, wow, that'd be a rough ride coming in because <laughs> he couldn't move. Well, and speaking of, uh, you know, finding the finding the right pilot, you know, what time frame does a person need to really be thinking about to have that sorted out? Like, yep, I'm booked with this dude, and we're going for these dates. I would imagine it's probably, you know, the fall or whenever you're hunting. It's generally a busy time of the year for those guys. You know, they can get booked up. I mean, in your experience, right. like, when does a person have to – do all that research on the front end to Mm -hmm. hit the go button. Well, I always say the more time, the better. And what I give, uh, just kind of a blanket recommendation here. I say a year to two years out, if you're going to plan a hunt in, in in Alaska, right? If you're, if you're planning a draw, uh, you know, a tag or to hunt an area that requires a draw for that particular species, then, you know, you're going to, you're going to want to do all the front end work of finding, obviously a guide or a charter before that, before putting in, and we put in, you know, beginning of November through like December 15th or 17th, and then the draw comes out the following February 15th to 17th. Mm-hmm. So before you even put in for that, you're putting in, you know, you're figuring your stuff out at least a year and a half in advance, right? Like, so, okay, I want to go on this hunt. Now I got to find a charter pilot. Now I got to find, you know, where, where I'm going to go, all the logistics we just talked about. And then I'm going to put in for that tag and cross my fingers. And if I draw, then it, you know, lights the fuse, uh, so to speak, to put that into motion to be able to get a hold of that charter pilot and say, you know, hey, I did draw, in fact, and uh, where, where am I in the lineup? If it is a harvest ticket, it's even actually more important. Harvest ticket being a general over-the-counter tag for, for those people that refer to that in various states in the, in the West because now you've got, you know, everybody that wants to go into that area can just offer an over-the-counter tag, right? Right. So some of those pilots and or boat captains may be two years booked out because they've had their clientele that are repeat clientele. So they'll be, they'll be booked out that far. And again, I go back to, I prefaced the, the story of the caribou and sheep hunt that I went in on. You know, I contacted him, uh, the pilot that I went with, I contacted him literally, I was in Alaska like three weeks and I got his name from the guide that I mentioned earlier. And I was like, Hey, um, this is this is what I'm looking at doing. And then I put in for the draw and I was lucky enough to draw the tag. Mm -hmm. And I had to get in that lineup. If I wouldn't have done that, I would have been, you know, basically SOL, so to speak. Yeah. Right. So to put it in perspective, like um, our hunting year is not a calendar year. The hunting year is starts July 1st and then, and, and goes then through June 30th. And so if you want to hunt in September, 2019, uh, you would have needed to, uh, and you weren't doing draw tags, um, so you're doing an application, which uh, in Alaska there's no point system; it's just a lottery. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you, you know, your just name goes into the hat. But uh, that application, like Casey said, would be in November, December 2018, right? right? And then in February 2019, you'll get the results of that, and then uh, immediately want to get on, get in touch with any charter services that you might be using or guides that you might be using. To, to say, okay, I pulled the tag, put me down. And so, like Casey said, you want to already have those wheels in motion before the results come out hmm. so that you know kind of already the steps you need to take. So you, you're doing that homework, you know, before November so that yep. you're knowing yep. what tags to put in for and, and who you want to go with. That's for draw hunts. You know, they're, they're, like Casey said, there's a, the, one of the coolest things about Alaska is that there is hardly any species in Alaska that you are not able to hunt. Over the counter, you can get an over the counter tag for just about everything in Alaska. Um, yep. You know, for somewhere in the yep. state, there's parts of the state that are even t- as a non resident. Even as a non resident, yes. there's tags for just about everything. Yeah, by I mean, huh. bison and muskox are trickier to get, but yep. like for moose, brown bear, black bear, you know, caribou, goat, sheep, all that stuff, there are over the counter tags available, non resident and resident for different parts of the state. Dude, I never would have guessed. Yeah. yeah. Now, what's a, is that a hard? Is that is it harder to hunt those because is there a lot more hunting pressure when you do go on those kinds of hunts because there are a lot more people can access it or? I would say across the yeah. board the answer is yes, but yeah. Alaska is big enough that there are plenty of pockets that you can hunt over the counter that are that have little to no pressure, but you got to hmm. w- obviously got to work harder or spend. 
I always say it comes down to either time or money, and you have to be willing to spend a lot of one or the other. <laughs> right, <laughs> you right, know? right. Like you can save money if you're willing to spend a lot of time <laughs> hiking in or doing yeah. a lot of research, and and the converse, is, the, the you know the opposite right. is true. If if you don't have a lot of time, you can shell out the cash and fat, you know yeah cut some corners. S- speaking of time, how much time should one plan to spend? Let's just say, all right, let's say you're beginner guy. Sorry for anybody who's just rolling in dough out there. I'm gonna I'm gonna skew this more towards a guy who's not rolling in dough, and you're and you're talking about maybe more time necessary. What would that time window be that you might want to have for the Is length of like a hunt? You mean two that kind weeks? Of thing? Yeah. You got right. like you should plan two whole weeks to be out there. Should you plan even more, or is that a, a little excessive? It really depends on the species and the area that you're hunting. Hmm. Um, you know, we've put down a lot of critters on day one. Like that's uh, <laughs> a lot, <laughs> which is funny because <laughs> um, we, we're always budgeting like. Oh, we're going in for 14 to 21 days. <laughs> it's like, day one, Boom. we're out. <laughs> yeah. um, but that being That's said... That's just beer money then, the rest of it, right? right. right. <laughs> uh, part of it is species and, and the limitations that you're setting for yourself, you know, what kind of animal you're trying to harvest, you know, and, and what the level of trophy quality. But I think 10 days is kind of the golden number that people throw around, you know, give or take a couple days. Uh, for most flying hunts, That's that's a good time to budget. The main thing to consider is that a lot of people don't factor in is because your access is usually on a boat or a plane, weather is a big deal. Yep. And hmm. so the thing that a lot of guys don't factor in, both time-wise and financially, is that it's very likely that you're going to get weathered in in one or two places for a period of one to, who knows, five days. Well, and that could be on the front end of your hunt exactly. where you're just waiting to You're not go even out. getting out there. Right. right. And so... From uh, we just talked to some good uh, buddies of ours who are from the East Coast and really want to go uh, moose hunting and and uh, first of all we're kind of saying what we've been saying this whole podcast don't, say, go <laughs> don't go moose hunting don't go moose hunting talking them out of it yeah. and uh, we're working on talking <laughs> them out of it but they were looking they're doing a good job of research and they were looking at a really good area um, for a do it yourself moose hunt um, but that area they have to fly to Anchorage uh, and then they have to get in a another um, smaller plane and fly to a little village and then they have to get in their charter service tiny plane and fly to the field so i was kind of explained to them hey look like getting to anchorage is no problem that's in like a normal flight anywhere you're getting on a 737 and it's no big deal weather's not going to be an issue most likely there once you hit anchorage weather is a huge factor because you're flying in these small planes that are affected by weather and, and, a lot, and they're not often flying by instrument in some cases and so you might have to wait in Anchorage for a couple of days um, before you can get into the village. And then once you get to the village, you might have to wait in the village for a couple of days before you can get into the field. And so all of a sudden, you're like, oh, wow, I didn't budget. Just the, There's one terrible little hotel in this village, and it's 300 bucks a night. Like, I didn't plan on that. Yeah. Right. Um, or there's no hotel, and there's 40 people in this village, and they, if they're nice, they might let you stay in the town hall, you know, for 75 bucks a night or something. We What we do is we... We're camping anyway. We have a tent. So we, when we were in those situations, we just camp out you know, near yeah. the airstrip and save the money. Um, yeah. And, Makes sense. Right. But just planning for that kind of stuff. Like, oh, wow, like I didn't think about, you know, okay, it, it's going to take us seven days to get this animal. We, you know, we want to budget seven days of our hunt plus a day to fly to Anchorage, a day to fly back from Anchorage. No. Uh, you know, give yourself a little wiggle room. Right, uh, because it's very likely that you you could get weathered in in these various places, and then obviously the m- place you're most likely to get weathered because you're flying in the smallest plane, or you know having a little boat come and get you is is the field is your you know, and you'll be ready to, oh hey I've got my animal down come pick me up and they may or may not come pick you up right away you know, <laughs> yep. depending on the weather and depending on what they're doing so. That's a big one, I would say, for mo- yep. money and time, budgeting that in. And what that means depends largely on the location you're hunting and the species you're hunting. You know, we just did a sick of blacktail hunt on Kodiak, and it was a four-day trip. It was in and out. And yeah, we know, got really lucky. But uh, we, we hit the weather window just yeah. right. It, it, we, like, literally, if it had been, if the plane had come 20 minutes later, we wouldn't have made it out. Right. And, we had a big storm rolling in. and Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's something for a person to be cognizant of to, I would think at least, to be, have the ability to monitor the weather in some capacity to know, hey, yeah, do we need to try and pull the chute and punch out early, you know? Right, right. Or are we prepared to stay 
longer if we can't get picked up, yeah. you know, for, mm. you know, one to who knows how many more right. days. I mean, people have been known. I feel like I'm, I'm not trying to scare people off, but I think it's something you need to be cognizant of is, yeah. right. you know, it may take a little bit to, you know, a little bit of extra time to get you know, and picked up. You should and totally you, do this. Be afraid, but you should do it. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, be really scared. I think that's part of the, it's part of the attraction. Like it is. I have personally like a love hate relationship <laughs> with it. And yeah. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you mentioned earlier, you, you've been to Kodiak before. So you, Mark, you, you know, that's about, but, uh, I will plan, you know, I'll sit, I'll sit down with John and I will plan different days for different areas of the state, right. At different length of time, depending on the difficulty of reaching that critter or, weather-wise, what those areas are like. So like Kodiak, right. I automatically chalk up four to six days of a trip to give it to Kodiak for weather, Yeah. right? So we're talking 10 to 14 days on most of our trips because if I get weathered for, you know, I got, I got a day in there, right? Mm-hmm. I got a day out. Well, there's two days off the trip, so now my 10-day hunt's eight days, mm-hmm. right? And you can't hunt the first day flying, right? Right. And, uh, or same day flying, excuse me. And so if you get weathered for five days... Well, now all of a sudden you're down to three or four days, depending on the length of your hunt. And you're kind of forcing your hand to be like, okay, I got to get out there and I got to start walking. I got to start hiking. I got to try to get something done. And uh, so I would, my suggestion would be, you know, depending on the area you're going to, a week minimum. And if it's somewhere like Southeast or Kodiak or something that's, or if you're flying in on a glacier, which, you know, kind of have their own weather, you know, automatically plan, plan two weeks, right? Those dang glaciers. <laughs> and dang glaciers. <laughs> um, so, I mean, and it runs a gamut. And if you get out early, great. A recent example, a quick story here that I uh, had this last fall. I had a, a good friend of mine come up, and he brought a friend in. And, uh, you know, I told him originally, I said, 10 days. Plan on 10 days for the hunt. And um, they went in there, and long story short, he was wanting to get out early and ended up shooting a caribou on, I believe, day two or day three. Okay. Um, and text the pilot on a DeLorem. And the weather socked in. Four days later, they made it out. And so he was just fit to be tied because he was like, well, geez, you know, can't come get us. And I need to get out of here and yada, yada, yada. And uh, I'm like, Alaska's got you. You know, like <laughs> it's, it's all there is to it. Like you you're, you're there. You're at the mercy. Yeah, she doesn't care about your plans. Hostage What you got going on, your job. It doesn't matter what you got going on. So make sure that you don't have like a big presentation or something do for your job <laughs> or something major, you know, uh, because if the weather moves in, it's just, it is what it is and just enjoy your hunt and, you know, do yeah. what you got to do. Well, I tell you one thing here is, uh, we are, we are on the road. We, I don't think we mentioned that yet. So this podcast is once again being brought to you by the mix master, not skills of me. But <laughs> if MC Ryan were here, he would be flashing me the one hour symbol and we would be remiss to not bring up gear mm. in this gear that you yeah. need. Yeah. So we got to talk about, because everybody loves gear, right? Gear is yeah. fun. Gear is the yeah. stuff that you get to go out and get, and it's new and exciting. Well, and you were talking about, I mean, you were a person that had a lot of gear, Casey. Yeah. And yet, yeah. on your first Alaska hunt, you know, not a lot of it was suitable for that, you know, kind of application. So, yeah, somehow I mean, Alaska requires different gear. So so for all those wondering out there what they're what they want, and I know that there's a lot that goes into it, not even just the actual things that you get, but you guys will probably get into this, is the weight. Yeah, right. The weight is huge. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, why, why don't you... This is a whole podcast right. by itself. It this could is be. Tough, know, we're going right? to we're gonna, um, we're gonna just condense like, it down. Yeah, the bullet, <laughs> the bullet points of gear, I feel like there are some basic truths that will apply across the board. You can spend a lot of money on gear, and, you know, there is some gear, I feel like, where it's worth putting the extra money in like a good backpack, good boots, good glass, things like that. You can't uh, skimp on that. There's other things like knives. Well, you know, we found that like you can find really good quality knives for for actually really really low dollar amounts. Uh, you don't have to buy a three hundred dollar knife. Um, as long as it stays sharp long enough. Yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, there's a just a, we live in an age where a good steel is not hard to find. But you can get your your full kit of kind of what people imagine you need in in Alaska, like super high end all you know all sick of gear and a uh, barney's pack or a stone glacier pack or you know whatever um just imagining all the highest end items you can and, yeah. and that's ideal you don't have to spend that kind of money there are ways around that but some general truths you're imagining okay you got to bring everything if if you're doing the kind of hunt that we're talking about where it's backpacking you need everything to survive right um, to fit in your pack and 
when we talk weight, our total pack weights are a little different than some people because we're filming stuff. So we're bringing some extra gear right. um, that other people aren't. But you want to think in terms of, all right, everything that comes with me, I need to have. Like, it's got to be a, a necessity. If it's if it's a backpack hunt, you can't really bring extra stuff just for fun. Every mm. Everything needs to have a very specific and vital purpose, preferably more than one purpose. I was just going to say, and, dual purpose, yep. And with certain items you're going to say, oh, weight is the most important factor in choosing this item. And another one, you're like, oh, no, durability is the most important factor. And hopefully you're finding a blend Mm -hmm. of quality products that are both lightweight and durable. We are happy to send our full gear list to to people. I've been actually meaning to put that as a download on our website. Awesome, man. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, that'd be really cool. And a lot of it's the season, season dependent too, right? How much gear you have. But I bring almost the same exact thing on all almost every one of our hunts the only thing that changes a little bit is adding or taking away a layer because it's colder or not colder and maybe footwear rotating yep, out yep. Mm-hmm. and maybe pack but rarely even that and and the firearm i guess so like do you want a quick rundown do we have time to do a quick yeah rundown? Like oh head yeah to, we have head to toe like what yeah like, absolutely so, and i'd be curious as you run through that too like some of those things you're mentioning before um casey where it was hey i use this all the time in wyoming for, but it's not suitable as much for Alaska. Right. right. So, yeah. so real, real quick before we do that, I echo everything John's saying hundred percent. I kind of break it down into five items that are like necessity. And, and the reason they're necessity to be very good is because your life is on the line, right? Mm-hmm. That's first and foremost. It doesn't, doesn't matter if you get an animal, if you die, right? <laughs> doesn't matter. Um, doesn't matter if you have a, a great quote. adventure. I mean, right? what, if it's a, what if it's a really big one though? <laughs> right. Right. So, Dang it, Mark, <laughs> um, I break those down in a kind of level of importance. First and foremost for me is boots. If you can't walk, you can't hunt. And Period. you die. Bar none. And you die. <laughs> Secondly would be a tent. Um, obviously, we're doing a lot of fly-in remote backpack hunts. Um, so a tent's got to be durable. It's got to be able to withstand just about anything Alaska can throw at it. Sleeping bag, it's a lifeline. Things get real bad. Your clothes do get wet. Uh, even if you have some of the best gear and clothing, you still need a good sleeping bag to be able to keep you warm and tent to help keep you dry. Backpack, obviously a huge deal. You're not just packing in, you know, we're going in 40, 50 pounds of gear, whatever, whatever you're taking in, but you also got to factor in you're taking out hundreds of pounds of meat mm-hmm. and gear and making multiple trips, and you're going to walk many, many miles with that gear, so you want to make sure that that backpack is able to haul that load com- as comfortable as possible. Anything over 100 pounds sucks, but for us, you know, we're, we've are we been running Barney's packs for a long time. Barney's Frontier Gear of Alaska, they're out of Anchorage there, and uh, they're just bomb proof packs. They're tough. They're heavier than most. They're external frame. Great pack. And then uh, last is your rifle, right? It's going to protect you. It's going to, you know, help you get food in case you're in a survival situation. So with that, I kind of digress and John, you can give him the rundown on gear. I no, guess. that's a good overall perspective, and yeah, there's definitely those are key pieces that you don't want right. to don't want to scrimp on too much. So let's see a quick quick head to toe. We've come to really like Sitka gear. Uh, we feel like it's a good blend of lightweight versus also still being durable, and they we like how much they put into R and D and thinking through products and taking feedback from guys who are using it in the field. So with that that in mind, I mean, there's other products that will get the job done for sure and they don't require you to spend that kind of coin um, but that's that's what we've ended up using yeah. and so uh, starting at the top and working down we believe in layers and everybody knows that by now you know that's kind of a common knowledge thing but it's it really is a big deal in Alaska and I take usually two hats into the field it's a, one is the merino wool beanie I'm a big fan of merino layers um, they're warm even when wet and we're out for you know 10 days we get stinky. Merino doesn't stink as much. That's mm-hmm. really nice in a two-man tent. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, it is. So, like, the the little Merino beanie, uh, I love that hat. And then just a, a, like a synthetic ball cap, and that's my headgear. Then uh, as my base layers on, against my skin, I wear a Merino wool T-shirt and uh, Merino wool boxers. And then darn tough socks. And that's the one thing that I don't do Merino for because I don't wear liner socks usually. It depends on the boot, though. Uh, and I, I guess I'll get to that in a minute. It's boot dependent. If I'm wearing leather boots, I'll generally generally be wearing a liner sock, um, and then it can be a merino wool. If I'm wearing the other boot we wear a lot is a Koflak plastic boot that has an inner booty, and in that case, I just wear uh, the synthetic darn tough socks. 
Uh, that that's me personally. Mm. And then but, leathers uh, were running Loas for for our leather boots. Right. And um, so that's base layer. I personally, this is more of a personal thing, but I never ever wear long johns in the field in the fall because I just can't. It's really? too hot. It's too hot. Huh. I, get, I just get. You know, we do enough hiking. I John don't... John does sweat more than any <laughs> human being on planet Earth. That's why I... <laughs> uh, I can't do it. So so long johns almost never come on a trip with me unless it's wintertime and you know temperatures are getting down to you know ten degrees, zero degrees or below, you know, and the, or we have enough weight is not an absolute yep. issue. And then it's kind of nice to have to wear them in a sleeping bag or something if it's a little colder out. But usually I don't bring long johns. So then the next layer is a Merino long sleeve shirt, uh, the Sitka Merino uh, zip tee that's long sleeve. I wear that over my wool t-shirt. Then the heavyweight hoodie that has the full face, ma- uh, not face mask built into it, but the zip comes up and covers your, your face quite a bit. And that, mm-hmm. that's nice for stalking, peeking over yeah. ridges. It's also nice when it's really cold out. Then I bring a puffy jacket. So actually I should step back a minute. Timberline pants are usually what I'm wearing in the field for a pant. I, f- I think those are best hunting pant in the world. There's something like if I had to pay full retail for all my gear and uh, there are some things that I wouldn't get that I use now if I had to pay full price for them. But those Timberline pants, I would yep. pay full price for them every year, and I would complain about it, but I would do it every, and, you know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> bomb proof. They are pants. absolutely the best hunting pant I've ever used. And um, so I run those. Then the next layer up is insulating layers. And so I bring both a puffy pant and a puffy jacket. So for me, that's the Kelvin pant and the Kelvin jacket. Or the Kelvin light jacket, depending on how the time of year. Yep. Uh, Mark loves the puffy. It, yep. It's a big, big deal. Fan. Those are th- that's a big big deal. And I personally big puffy guy. <laughs> some guys go down. Some guys go synthetic. And there's pu- pluses to to both. For my puffy pants and puffy jacket, I choose to go synthetic because they do tend to um, run the risk of getting damp. So I, I like that. So I don't have to worry about that as much with the synthetic. So, and just a side note here on that, with your, keep in mind with your puffy pants, that is your second sleeping bag. If a bear gets into your tent and rips your tent down and everything else, and you're, you always want to have that puffy jacket and puffy pant in your pack at all times, you know, yeah, you're hiking around a little bit more weight, but it doesn't matter. And it's the same for your rain gear. It's your extra yeah, tent, right? Yeah. right? So. Yeah. No, I was, I'm glad you said that. That was actually the next thing I was going to say um, is that, you know, the next layer on top of that is a full rain suit, rain pant, and rain coat. Uh, for me, there's several good options out there, but features that I look for in a rain pant and rain coat, I want full zips on the pants so yep. that you can take them on and off over your boots uh, without mm. taking your boots yeah. off because rain rolls in really fast. Last thing you want to do is sit down on the wet ground, unlace your big old you know high lace boots. And then stand up, you know, and look for a place to stand up with your sock, stocking feet in the tundra. <laughs> pull on pants, you know, then lace your boots back up. Yeah. That's a super drag. Trying and not to get your socks wet. Thank you. Yeah, right. exactly. Complete so mess. Full, full zip uh, rain pants, that's a big deal. And then jackets with good uh, pit zips that zip as big dump as heat, possible yep. to dump heat when, when you're hiking around. I think right now uh, my favorite is the, the Cloudburst pant, sick of Cloudburst pant. And the Stormfront jacket, I've been using those the most. The, uh, the is it the Dew Point? I always mix that up. Is that, is that their ultralight one? That's their ultralight yeah. one, yeah. And those are really nice because they're so light and so packable. But I do sometimes appreciate the little extra heavy-duty-ness uh, of the of the heavier stuff that's going through brush and things like that. Yeah. Hmm. Heavy rain pour, heavy rainfall, they seem to hold up a little better. And then, like Casey said, those things never, never stay in camp those things go with you all the time that full kit goes with you everywhere yeah and that way we don't bring our sleeping bags with us usually unless we're planning on spending the night out but sometimes you do spend the night out when you're not planning and you know you put a critter down late at night or we haven't had you know situations really where we got into trouble and we're like someone has a broken leg and we can't get home but you know can't get back to camp but like that can happen and to know that you've got a puffy coat and puffy pants and a rain suit you throw all that on I mean, you'll make it through the night. Like, you know, that's right. that's enough to get get you through. So we, you know, we bring that stuff on every hunt, whether it's August or whether it's October. Well, as a matter that, of fact, just this last fall, comes with us. Uh, we had a moose hunt and I knocked a moose down at, you know, 6.30 in the evening or whatever. And at the time we got done, you know, taking our photos and doing our video and, 
and started butchering. It was dark, and uh, we ended up butchering through the night, and then we made a little fire, and I was really glad I had my, my puffy stuff, and if we would have got rain, we didn't, thankfully, but if we would have got rain, it would have rolled through. I would have had my gear because I just wasn't going to, we were just going to risk going back through the dark in thick bear country and smelling like a moose, right? Like, <laughs> I, would, I would rather just hang tight, let the sun come up, you know, not get that much sleep. You're a little weary, a little out of it, but you can make it back to spike camp and then, you know, re-gear from there. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, being able to spend the night or and having the choice to make yeah, yeah. that call, right. I mean, that's a big safety right. deal right there. Absolutely. And not just bears, but like you said, you, you're tired, just you're disoriented, navigating, navigating at night. Yeah. Yeah. It's super sketchy. Yeah. yeah. So that that's kind of what I'm wearing. Oh, I guess I didn't say gloves. I, I tend to run hot and don't mind... I don't wear gloves in the field a whole lot. I have like Sika really lightweight liner gloves. They've chained. I think cur- currently the equivalent would be the Traverse glove or the Merino glove that they have. Um, and I cut the fingers off of them, and that's pretty much the only glove that I wear on 90% I mean, I, of our hunts. I've actually noticed that, and I think I would have to think that you're a little bit of an outlier <laughs> when it comes to that because I've seen some images in some pretty frigid situations, yeah. and I'm like, did John lose his gloves? <laughs> Look, Mark. Not everybody has as screwed up hands as we do, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm temperature sensitive. Very well, temperature sensitive. Um, but Instant, <laughs> just blister, <laughs> lacerations. <laughs> Terrible. That being said, that when I do take other gloves, mountain glove or the stormfront glove are the ones that I will bring based on the terrain and stuff. But I usually never wear them, and I get angry that I packed them around the whole time. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've started to leave them behind more and more on it, on the earlier season trips. Uh, then footwear... It depends a lot on the hunt we're going on, but generally speaking, we're running Koflak plastics, both of us, which are kind of uncommon hmm. to, uh, to most people who hunt outside of Alaska, and even to people who hunt in, everybody's aware of them that hunt in Alaska, but yeah. I would say probably only like 20% of mountain hunters actually wear them, right. or something to give it, I'm just throwing that number out there, but something like that. But we like them a lot because for a bunch of reasons, they're a full mountaineering boot, so they provide a lot of protection to your feet, a lot of rigidity. Um, that you want from a mountaineering boot. They're crampon compatible in some of the terrain we go in. You know, it's really nice to have crampons. Which, um, so that's a plus. But the big thing, I guess the two biggest things for me, all center around the booty system that they have. So they have a soft inner booty that you lace up or Velcro up, depending on the model that you have. And then that goes into a, uh, the hard plastic outer boot shell. And I guess for those that aren't familiar, and maybe you cover this, like picture a ski boot almost. Basically, right. Yeah, exactly. like a, almost like a lightweight Yep. low-profile ski boot. That's exactly huh. right. And to drive the point home of how uncommon they kind of are, even in the even in like the sheep and goat hunting world, which is what we're primi- primarily using them for, we've had a lot of other guides looking at us and go, why are you wearing, are you wearing, wearing ski boots? Well, yeah. that's because in the guiding world, it depends, but a lot of the guides that we're working with, they're only going out for two or three days at a time and it's kind of right, a right, special right, use right. case. But because of that booty system, A, you're eliminating the wear point, the friction point is between the booty and the plastic shell, not between your foot and the boot. Okay. So you're eliminating a lot of blisters, which is uh, for me was a big a oh. big thing. I noticed that was huge. Yep. Then you are eliminating wet feet. Now they're because they're plastic, they don't breathe super well during the day. And I sweat a lot. So like your feet do get hot, your feet do get sweaty. So you have to mm. be cognizant of that and it's best to stop periodically if you're hiking a lot and sweating a lot and air your feet out. Well, you know, glass for a little while and air your feet out. But you can take those booties out. And so every night I'd take those booties out, throw them in my sleeping bag with me. And in the morning you have dry, warm feet. And that's amazing. If you're in really wet country that, you know, leather is eventually going to saturate. Yep. And even a Gore-Tex boot is eventually going to saturate. And then you're hiking around in wet boots all the time. Or if it's later season, they get wet during the day. And then at night they freeze. And that super sucks in the morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's a big deal. That's what one of the, and then the final thing is uh, river crossings. You can, there's usually a lot of stream crossings in Alaska hunts. So we just pull the inner booty out of our boot and wear the plastic outer shell and roll up your pants if it's a small creek and yep. take them off if it's a big creek and cross that way. And then you're not barefooting it across this, uh, you know, boulder stream. <laughs> right, right. You just straight up go no pants to the creek? Yeah, if it's deeper. You don't want to get your pants all wet. Right. Yeah. Strip down to your undies. Yep. That's Alaska. Right, right. Man, I don't, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but never would have never would have thought of just. John get goes no gloves, no pants, no gloves, no pants. <laughs> get that drop, yeah. So yeah, that's basic clothing gear, right? Yeah. Then 
like I said, we could go days. I know we could go forever. What it, what it, <laughs> like the next step packs a really important choice. You know, the first question is internal or external. I feel like a lot of internal packs are becoming kind of a hybrid where they're semi-external now. Yep. And there's a lot of good choices out there. We've tried quite a few, and part of it's personal preference. Part of it's the type of hunt you're going on. I think the main thing is with any gear, but it's especially true of packs, is don't take anything into the field that you haven't field tested yourself personally because you know to go out on a bunch of shakeout patrols do day hikes do camping trips ahead of time because you're going to notice so many little things that you never ever ever were going to notice right. looking at the features in a catalog or even handling the item in the store mm-hmm. or even wearing like wearing the item in the store but you spend a couple days hiking in it it's going to become quickly apparent oh i really like this feature or i really hate this feature or, oh this thing wears the heck like gives me this rub spot you know or yeah um whatever it is so field test your gear casey brought up the pack that we use the most which is made in alaska it's kind of a it's something i don't see a lot outside of alaska but uh it's the gold standard in alaska yeah. and that's the frontier gear of alaska pack made by barney sports in anchorage and we love that one for a lot of our hunts but i mean kafaru stone glacier mystery rants those are those are brands that are ones yeah. that are very commonly used by a lot of the experienced hunters in alaska for the type of hunts that we do too yeah. Well, and the other thing too is with the with the Barney's pack is you know we're doing a huge plethora of hunts right like like we're hunting everything from muskox to to brown bear to sheep to goats to you name it and uh, some of them animals uh, brown bears for example it's really hard if you've if you've never tried to put a ten foot brown bear into most internal frame packs it is it's yeah, it's that's not going to happen specific <laughs> right <situation. laughs> but but you know you you want you want to have enough room in a pack and and the barney's pack gives us that versatility so that's why we run a lot nothing against any other packs right like there's a lot of good packs out there as john was saying i think yeah. that is something that we do see not new to alaska hunters the two mistakes i see them make with packs is they get it too small of a pack or they get too busy of a pack that's over-engineered and has a lot of extra yeah. pockets and zippers and features that just add weight and without function. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one thing I see with packs, too, is, ah, man, like all those brands you mentioned, they're they're making such a high-quality product, and you're really not sacrificing a lot where it comes to, like, weight or something like that right. to get the bigger volume pack. Right. If you're not carrying that much gear, maybe it's a day hunt, you can cinch it down. Yes, and it's lightweight, it's compact, but then if you need to fill it full of a right. critter on your way back to camp, you have a lot more volume. Again, to going true. back to those Very five, true. And, and going back to those five items I mentioned earlier, if, you're, if weight is your issue, which like for John and I, weight is definitely our issue, we can cut weight elsewhere, right? right. I would rather cut weight in, basic example, in my food a little bit than I would cut weight in my pack if I know that I've got to haul a moose quarter out or if I've got to haul an entire sheep out or something on that nature, you know, I want the extra room. Right? Yeah. What do you say? So we talked a little bit about what you guys are wearing, but what do you say in order to uh, maybe make this a sweet teaser for a future podcast and then also uh, make sure that since we're on the road here, everybody gets to where they need to go uh, on time. We'll save a full Alaska gear podcast for another date. Yeah, think. that'd be a blast. But at least we awesome. went through. At least we went through. I thought some of that stuff that you were talking about for the uh, for the clothing itself was very interesting. I was also checking out those boots you were talking about. Those were mm-hmm. pretty crazy looking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, space boots. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's do a quick round of last calls. So for those uh, you guys are new to the, the podcast here, we do last calls. It's basically just what's ever on your mind as we close this out. Bring it in for a landing. The flight attendant at this point would be saying, "Please return your seats to their upright position." And Tray back tables to their folded and I thought I had that memorized. So I don't. <laughs> I'd be a bad flight attendant. You need to pay attention to the safety brief, Jim. True. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Mark, you want to kick this, these ones off? Yeah, man. Yeah. We've been talking a lot about uh, logistics here when it comes to Alaska, and I think Alaska is just intrinsically, logistically more complex when it comes to just about everything. And and we talked about meat care and i think one thing a person needs to think about is um getting your meat back home Dude, you know, i'm I guess, so glad you said that and i'm talking from i guess an, probably more so an out of staters perspective you know our or my home state right now is wisconsin and you know getting that meat back home is something you need to take into consideration and i'm going to tie this back into what you guys were talking about maybe not choosing a moose 
for the first time. Right. Because just the sheer size of those animals in the field is a whole extra layer of logistics. And getting that much meat home is a whole nother set of logistics, which I found out, even though I thought I'd prepared for it, it just got a little bit weird. We got it all home, and I'm very meat rich you right the now. the old FedEx route. We did, yeah. And it cost me a pretty penny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but anyway, so I think that's just something, something to be thinking about, whether it's, you know, you plan to uh, pack your meat in, in fish boxes that you buy up in Alaska, which can work quite well. I've used uh, Yeti hoppers, you know, but that's, those are going to work better for some of these smaller animals where you may be taking, you know, 15 to maybe even a couple hundred pounds of meat home. You yep. know, you start going beyond that and, you know, it's a little bit, a little bit different fish to fry. So that, right. that's my final call is, you know, be prepared to get that meat back home because that is, you know, quite possibly the biggest, I'm not even going to say that's the biggest trophy because the memories and the place and the pictures and everything, I mean, it, it's all, it's part of, it's all, it's part of, definitely but a big part of it. Plan on it plan on it and it is i think that's often overlooked on um is that on the back end oh now what um how do we get this stuff out of here and planning ahead we often bring big plastic totes okay um, and put our backpacks inside of them on the way out and then uh, or on the way in and then on the way out those backpacks are a separate piece of luggage and the the uh, meat is going and hides and stuff are going into these plastic totes and a lot of the hubs the bigger villages and towns will have freezer space where you can ask for cold storage and okay. huh. and get that stuff frozen so even though those plastic totes aren't insulated they you know if they're sitting in a freezer it's fine but uh yeah usually fish boxes are available but you can't always count on that sometimes you want to ship that out ahead of time mm-hmm. with you and you got to budget it you know you're like oh okay i'm going to be spending 60 cents to a dollar a pound to ship this out just to get it out of the field you know right, <laughs> right. Yeah. um and then shipping it home from there. So, yeah. Or it could be I'm an extra plane, an extra plane ride. Right? Yeah, it absolutely yep. is yeah. an extra plane ride, yep. which often is factored into your charter service. They okay. know they know that if they're if they know if they're taking you in for moose, oh yeah, if they shoot a moose, sometimes there's an extra fee, like say it's twelve hundred dollars up front, and then if you shoot a moose, they're gonna add five hundred. And okay. they make that make you aware of that. Right. Okay. So yeah, but it's definitely definitely something to think about for sure. I guess my my last thought is, you know, we, we didn't get all the way through gear. There's so much other stuff to touch on, but one of the, you know, good glass is super important, right? Um, that's something that we, we don't think you can scrimp on, and uh, we've been using Vortex for a long time and love it, and that's why we're sitting here, you know, today. And, I, you know, I want to thank you guys for putting out such a great product. Something we could talk a lot about each individual piece of glass, but something I, I think that a lot of people miss when they are picking out a rifle scope for Alaska Obviously, you want all the features of a normal scope for any, you know, in Alaska, weather's really hard. So you want something that's going to be resistant to the bangs of rocks and the the rain. Your scope's going to get wet 100%. But all that aside, I recommend for most hunts, you want a scope that is going to get a little wide, like four power or, you know, two to four power on the low end. I wouldn't take us for most hunts in Alaska, I wouldn't take a scope that only goes down to, say, six power. Or something like that, because so often, you know, we have bears. It's a reality, you know. And if you get in a close encounter with a bear and you pull up on six power, all you might see is brown, mm. right? Right. Yeah. Uh, and that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. You know, and a lot of Alaska is just thick. And you know, whether you're making a follow-up shot on a critter that you've already, you know, shot, or you're just stalking them in heavy, heavy brush. Yeah, it's nice to have that wide end on a scope, and I think that's something you know, a lot of people forget when they look, see those big open terrain pictures of tundra or mountains, mm-hmm. and they they're like, "Oh yeah, well, you know, I'm gonna shoot that thing at 800 yards," and you know, which they can, but something to be aware of. Yeah, that's a good call. I like yeah. it. Casey. Yeah. Um, well, we touched a lot of different things, and I would say, you know, one thing that we didn't touch on, and we can talk a little bit more about uh, when we get into uh, gear the next podcast is physique uh being in shape and um, what you want to do to prepare uh, for that and that's one thing that i mean i'm no model of physical fitness myself i mean i go to the gym i work out i hike and yada 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 but i can you can always be better stronger faster um and preparing for those hunts so that's something you know that i would uh um love to talk more about at at, at another time but it's uh i guess a uh a bug that put in everybody's ear and can kind of flesh through that down the road so nobody that we've ever helped 
get set up to hunt in Alaska has ever come up in good enough shape, I don't think. No. <laughs> right. And we set it up and, ourselves and the, every fall, too. Right. Like, we go in and we're like, gosh, dang it, you know, we prepared, <laughs> but we could be in better shape, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. The only and, time you're in good shape is at the end of hunting season. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So. I think what we determined is that we we're, we might call this taking on the Alaskan frontier 0.5 because there's another, a whole other section <laughs> right. that we got to get into. We're talking about, yeah, the physique and the, and the rest of the gear. Um, will definitely be good. Uh, my last call is, check these guys out on Instagram, and it will inspire you to want to go do this. I was also going to ask you guys, too, out of curiosity, a lot of people like to understand what they're getting themselves into. We've, we've talked a lot about the time and a lot of the logistics and things like that. As far as the budget goes... For the average guy or gal who's looking to get into this, coming up from the main lower 48, spending about 10 days roughly going after a caribou, stick of blacktail, something like that. If you had to throw out a ballpark, obviously we're never going to be exact, but a ballpark figure that people should budget. I would say not counting gear. Not counting gear, yeah. Uh, not counting gear. So I would say three grand. Yeah. Or, or you know you could do it for less absolutely, um, but budgeting two or three grand is going to definitely be doable. You think that's right. including like plane tickets there? And yeah, then that's, that's the factoring meat flying, to, flying to Anchorage. Yeah, all 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 in two to three. Yeah, I would I all would in. say two to three thousand depending on where you're at, depending okay. on where and, you're at. and what you're going after. Like and, if you're flying into the Brooks Range, your plane ticket alone is going to be three thousand dollars. So right, and, like, and, you know, <laughs> ten, right, right. For, and, I mean, once you get to Alaska, <laughs> it's yeah. going to be three grand for just right. that one charter. So it depends on where you want to go. But I would say you, for the most part, three grand. Um, I would agree with that. Is is definitely doable, and you can do it for five hundred bucks. I mean, there's there's ways to do it. Yeah, right. There's there's yeah. I mean, there's definitely right. ways to do it. And like you said, depending on what you're going after, you know, uh, sick of blacktail tag is going to be about three hundred bucks, and a moose tag is going to be about eight hundred bucks. So you you know factor that, and you know, right. add, yeah. again, I, I'm coming from straight that out of state perspective. Exactly. But, right. Non resident tags. Um, yeah. But I'd say yeah. You know, I was gonna, when Jim brought that up, I was like, gosh, you know, I'm, and I was gonna say between twenty five and four. You yep. know, depending yep. on yep. and yeah. like, and then you guys hit the exact middle ground of that of you know, on average three. Yeah. Yep. yep. Well, there you have it, folks. Like we said, we're gonna have to follow this up with some more information on Alaska. As always, though, now this gives you the chance if you're out there listening, uh, hit us up on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast and let us know what you might want to hear when we do the uh, other half to this Alaskan first timer, if you will, podcast prepping prepping you guys to go out there. And, and take it on. So let us know on Instagram. Also, like we said, follow these guys at 60th Parallel on Instagram, too. You will see some of the most incredible images ever. With that said, how about we sign off on the classic bye? Bye. Bye. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. Leave us a review or comment down below. We want to hear what you have to say about the show, maybe what you like, maybe what you didn't like, so that way we can make these podcasts as good as they can be. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'll be posting about each episode released, so that way you can go back, find these things, maybe grab a little nugget of information that you could take with you to the range, out in the field, or uh, maybe to the kitchen if we're talking about some good food. So, again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.